Great, thank you very much everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Emily Benn, I'm the Director of Programmes here at the Big Tent Festival. Thanks so much for joining us uh, this afternoon, this evening, um, for our In Conversation event uh, with Sarah Baxter and Janine Di Giovanni. Um, before we start, just a few housekeeping notes uh, that you may have seen just a second ago. Um, firstly, this session is being recorded um, and it will be available to view uh, in the members section of the Big Tent website and may be used for promotional purposes. Uh, if you'd like to watch a replay of this event uh, or any of the other Big Tent sessions that we are doing, um, it's one of the exclusive benefits of being a Big Tent friend. So please sign up. Um, you can sign up on the website or one of the Big Tent emails and we also do student friend memberships. Um, thanks so much to our partners for today's session, which is Finn Partners. Um, how it's going to work is we're going to have uh, a bit of time between Sarah uh, and Janine. They're going to have a chat uh, about life and experiences. Um, but what we'd really love is for, you, for everyone to kind of populate the chat with questions. Since we're going to save the end of the conversation for audience uh, interaction. So if you could just, uh, on the Zoom chat, type in your question and uh, I will call you later on. Thanks to all of you that uh, did some kind of pre-shared questions, which I'll make sure I'll ask. Um, and, and we'll finish at 6.30. Uh, the room will be available uh, for another kind of half an hour-ish for informal discussion between you guys, uh, audience, if, if you want to stick around, uh, if there's anything you want to talk about. Um, but without further ado, uh, really, really delighted to introduce our two speakers today. We are very, very grateful. First up, we've got Sarah Baxter. Uh, who's deputy editor uh, of the Sunday Times. Uh, she's a former Sunday Times Washington correspondent, editor of the News Review and editor of the Sunday Times magazine, as in inf as, and is in fact uh, leaving to go back to America some point later this summer. So thank you, Sarah. And we are equally really delighted to have um, Janine D Giovanni here, uh, currently senior fellow and professor at Yale um, at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. She's a 2019 Guggenheim fellow, a multi award winning journalist, uh, most recently for her book, The Morning They Came for Us Dispatches from Syria, which was published um, in 30 languages. She's finishing another book, which I know she's going to talk about. Um, and in 2020, the American Academy of Arts and Letters awarded her their highest non fiction prize, The Blake Dodd. Uh, that's only just a sample of the, the uh, life and career of both these extraordinary women. Um, so Without further ado, Sarah, if you uh, would like to kind of kick off and start the conversation, and thank you so much, everyone, and we'll get to questions um, shortly. Thanks very much, Emily, and uh, hello, Janine. It's really great to see you here. And I just want to say from the off that um, you're the reporter I'd have loved to be in another braver life. I just didn't have the guts to do it. I mean, uh, you really have been all over the place. Um, you know, you've reported on what, the Palestinian Intifada, you've been in you're all over the Middle East, all the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, you've been in Africa, Somalia, some of the, you know, Sierra Leone, Leone some of the most dangerous places in the world. So why did you do it? And I didn't. What motivated you to be that intrepid? I, I absolutely did not want to be a journalist. Um, it, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I always wanted to be a writer, but I, I didn't have this kind of burning desire, as many of my colleagues have, to be a reporter. Um, I mean, my career basically started, I, I started as an academic, and it's interesting because now this kind of full circle of my life, um, I'm an academic again, um, having worked for, for 30 years in the field. I what, what really started me was um, I saw a newspaper article um, in the time of the first intifada, which is uprising in Arabic, um, in Palestine. And it was about a Jewish lawyer who was a Holocaust survivor, who at that time was the only lawyer defending uh, Palestinians in military court. And I read this article about her and it, it just, her courage, her, her, quest for justice, her ability to, to work and, and, and often not win any cases, maybe she won very few cases, but to still do it, um, really did something to me. It changed my life entirely. So I flew to Israel. I met her. She was called Felicia Langer. And she mentored me. Um, basically, she sent me to the West Bank and to Gaza, the Gaza Strip during the first intifada. I had no idea 
how to be a reporter. I really didn't. Um, I, had, I had no training courses. I knew how to be an academic. I knew how to write. Um, but I didn't know how to ask questions. I didn't know how to take care of myself. Anyway, you, you either sink or swim. And I, um, I swam. It's and very after interesting, though, what you say, Janine, because it, you obviously had what I would call a nose for a story. Mm -hmm. And what makes journalism isn't actually what some people think it is, which is the great, you know, clash of ideas. And it's about people. And it's interesting to me that you started with a, a story about a woman. I don't, I don't think I do have, I, do, I think I'm a terrible reporter. I was never able to, you know, thrust a microphone in someone's face and say, how do you feel? Or what, what I'm good at is um, going somewhere for a long time, digging in and writing long format. Um, and, and that's after Israel, um, I wrote a book about that. And then uh, I was working for the Sunday Times back under Andrew Neil, who was a, an amazing editor. And I really wanted to go to Bosnia because it was the siege of Sarajevo. And I had to fight my way through the men on the foreign desk who didn't want, you know, a woman to go. But I went. And what happened is I stayed. I refused to come back. And I ended up staying there throughout the siege for, for three and a half years, going back and forth, you know, to London for breaks now and then. And then after Bosnia, I wrote a few more books. And then I went to Africa for, for many, many, many years. Um, so it wasn't that I was a, a scoop maker. I mean, Marie Colvin was good at scoops. I could never, you know, the Sunday Times, the whole concept of getting a scoop just befuddled me because it's just not my thing. I, I'm much more interested in um, kind of unraveling society and, and how war and conflict affects society and it affects individuals. Yeah, now, you, you brought up Marie Colvin, who, of course, mm -hmm. I knew very well at the Sunday Times. She was a great colleague of mine. And, um, you know, for those who don't know her, she died very tragically in Homs in Syria in 2012. And one of the things um, that I think has happened with the kind of conflict reporting that you've been doing is it's got a lot more dangerous. And to spend long time somewhere embedded is very hard. Have you noticed that? Have you has, has that created problems for you as a... Look, it was, it was always dangerous. Um, to be honest, in the 90s, Bosnia, um, Somalia, Sierra Leone, where two of my really close colleagues were, were murdered, Kurt Shork and, and Miguel, Miguel Di Moreno, um, you know, working in Africa with militias, child soldiers. Um, and in those days, you know, now I think when journalists work, especially if they're working for big news organizations, there's so much more protection. There's war insurance, there's flak jackets, there's helmets. Back in, back in the day when I was working, you literally got sent off with a, maybe if you were lucky, a satellite phone, some money, no instruction. Um, and also something, I think now editors are much more cautious of people getting kidnapped and hurt. In those days, they, I mean, for instance, Chechnya, I was in Grozny when it fell. One of the most terrifying experiences of my life. There were no other reporters there other than a German photographer I was working with. And, you know, these days, I don't think an editor would allow someone to do that. But in those days, I was really pressured to stay and to get more and more, even though, you know, my life was a, a huge danger. Um, the bombardment was probably more fierce than Aleppo um, when I was in Aleppo during the, the Syrian war. It's dangerous now. It was dangerous then. It's, it's really um, a, a very, very complicated career. And I think it's something that one needs to navigate a balance between taking risks and how much you're actually going to get from it. Um, well, if I, you've made sorry. a very good point about those dangers, and it's right. I mean, Marie um, is, was not the only reporter to die in very tragic circumstances. I'm glad you've reminded us of that. And I recall another Sunday Times colleague who you'll remember, John Swain, getting kidnapped in um, Eritrea and yeah. held hostage. Um, I think you're right. I think as an, as an editor, I know that the whole procedures have become more bureaucratic. And in some ways, that's right, because we do want to you know, we feel we have more of a duty of care to people who are out in the field. But it's, it's also true that, um, you know, I think foreign correspondents have sometimes felt undue pressure to go to places where they are at extreme risk. And that's, that can be very difficult. 
Well, you know, I work a lot on war crimes. Um, that's really the focus of, of my work um, and has been for many, many years. So a lot of what I do is, is getting testimonies from people that could possibly be used in war crimes tribunals, um, either at The Hague, the ICTY for the former Yugoslavia, or Arusha for the former, for the Rwanda crimes, the Sierra Leone um, war crimes tribunal. And there will be one for Syria, which my last book, was basically um, a documentation of, of torture, of, um, of victims of torture and, and systematic rape. Um, so, I mean, I think different reporters have different ways of working. You know, you, get, you do get cowboys, you get people that love being in this adrenaline filled situation. That was never me. I mean, I work much more, um, I'm not interested in scoops, I'm not interested in headlines, I'm not interested in getting, being the first one there. I'm interested in really embedding with families or communities, or right now I'm working on a book called The Vanishing, which is about um, Christians in the Middle East, Christian communities in the Middle East that are being eradicated. Um, so, I mean, really what I do is much more, um, I would say it, not more methodical, but it's definitely, definitely more academic and more anthropological um, you know, I, I really like to go and get in very deep. I don't, I'm not interested in a, a quick, fast um, trip or a quick, fast... Uh, no, it's what, uh, what some male reporters used to call the bang-bang, right? So, yeah, 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 not my thing. It's not I, that. I mean, one of the things about going deep into the heart of communities is that you can often get at the women's stories. And I, you know, I'm very glad that... Uh, um, a reporter like you and a writer like you is, is actually looking at what happens to women in war. Can you tell us a bit more about your work in that field? Well, during the Bosnian war, um, there were nearly 25,000 women who were raped um, systematically in rape camps in Eastern Bosnia, Foča and, and other places. Um, one of the great tragedies of, of that was that it, it was systematic rape because it was ordered on high from a chain of command. And also many of those women were raped deliberately, the Muslim women, to break their gene pool. In other words, they were raped by Serb soldiers so that they would give birth to children who were half Muslim, half Serb. Um, those children today are 25 years old because the war was, um, or, or older, 27. Um, they're born in 1992, 1993. There's only a handful of men who have been prosecuted for those crimes. And those women who suffered, some of them were raped up to 16 times a day. I mean, they were kept, it literally was like a rape factory. They were kept in places where they were continuously raped in order to get them pregnant. Similar thing happened in Rwanda in 1994 during the genocide, which I, which I also reported. Um, so look, why, why is there rape during wartime? Why is there sexual, sexual violence during wartime? several reasons. One is to instill fear in the community so that um, people will run away. And during the Syrian war, one thing that I tracked was that um, the militias would send word, you know, we're coming, basically, so that then people would gather their, their families, their daughters, their wives, pack a few things and run. So it's a very efficient way to clear, to ethnically cleanse entire regions. Um, so, you know, one, one major fallout from, from um, wartime is sexual violence, but it's not just women. Um, I mean, and I think sometimes reporters make mistakes when they focus entirely on this is just a woman's issue and um, women's, women are the ones who suffer the most. You know, I, I've, I've spoken to many men who have been sexually violated in, in Assad, uh, Bashar al-Assad's prisons in Syria. Um, in Bosnia, um, in Africa, um, there's a lot of child abuse. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think I look for women's stories in particular. I listen, I, I listen to people and I say to them, what happened to you? Um, and, and I try to get their, their, what you would call their stories, but to me it's their, their histories and it's a testimony. Um, and I do it because I don't want anyone to ever say in 50 or 100 years time that this did not happen because it's documented, it's there. 
And that's why the war in Bosnia was so important. And I'm so proud of what my colleagues and I did there. Um, because now there is this whole kind of historical um, um, backlash where, where there, there is a lot of, um, a lot of uh, historians, writers, academics who say that it, what happened at Srebrenica was not a genocide. So if we have our records and if we have our notes and if we have our stories and our photographs, there is no way that they can say it, it didn't happen. Yeah, I know it's an extraordinary age that we're in, this age of denial of what people have clearly seen with their own eyes. Now, some of that um, witness bearing that you've been doing, Janine, for so long, does come at a personal cost, doesn't it? I mean, I was fascinated by your brilliant book, Ghost by Daylight, about, Thank you. about you know, the, the, the struggle to cope with all that in a, in a, you know, you, you lead a normal life like the rest of us, you know, you live in Paris, you, well, but maybe, I'd say it wasn't that normal because you're very um, international. You've got your job at Yale, you live in Paris as well, you're in London, New York, you get about. But, <laughs> um, but in each of those cities, you're just a woman on the street, but actually you have to deal with a lot of demons, don't you? And there's a sort of fraternity and sorority of people who have, witnessed almost too much, who get PTSD, who have a strong bond, but, you know, it's not always easy to just come back to, you know, your normal apartment and life. What would you say about that? It's, um, it's interesting. I, I just wrote a paper about something called moral injury. Um, and moral injury is basically, it's very different from PTSD. PTSD is considered a mental, um, a mental Ill illness um, where moral injury is something that's being investigated now. But it's really something that a lot of journalists suffer who were covering the European refugee crisis. Um, and for instance, were on beaches when people were drowning and couldn't save them and instead decided to record it or write about it rather than jump in the sea and swim out and, 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 and save a family that uh, whose boat had capsized. So. 20 years ago, um, a, a psychologist, a South African psychologist called Anthony Feinstein started the first ever study on um, PTSD and its effect on war reporters. It, it took him three years and it was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. It was a huge um, shift because after Anthony published that study, I, I, was, I was one of the people he, um, he studied for three years. Um, people started taking it seriously. The BBC, um, all of the big networks then began debriefing journalists. They began preparing them more before they went into difficult situations. Um, and they began treating, looking at different ways to treat PTSD. Um, and it, you know, now PTSD is a term that's thrown around so casually. I, I've actually, you know, I've heard many people say, oh, you know, I just had a big trauma and now I have PTSD. But um, it is something actually categorized, you know, by very specific, uh, a very spe specific um, diagnosis. And but now Anthony Feinstein is working on moral injury, and he's beginning a new study to try to see how reporters who have been covering or uh, Trump's America, you know, reporters having to witness Trump's America, for instance, or you were just talking about Dominic Cum Cummings. I mean political reporters that have to witness things that go against their own moral core, their own moral fiber. Um, you know, it's, it's literally the way that Dr. Feinstein describes it is it's a scar on your soul because well, it's I something- I read his research. I find what you're saying very interesting. I, yeah. I've been a political um, reporter myself, worked at Westminster. I've covered, um, well, I covered the election of Barack Obama in, in America, which was obviously a very different era. Um, happy time uh, right yeah. <laughs> but um absolutely um but it was um i always felt that political reporters they i love being a political reporter because you could be sort of present at sort of history being made but you didn't have to feel implicated in it what i think what i, I did um i was a new york correspondent when 9 11 happened and i was there at the um twin towers as they fell and that was very shocking because I was totally unprepared for it, you know, like the rest of the world, you know, it was a beautiful morning. And then suddenly you're watching people die and you have to run for your life. And it was terrible. But people used to ask me, are you all right? I, you know, 
dry a bit in the morning, every, you know, reading about the missing and the dead. But they say, are you all right? But actually, I found it really comforting to go about doing my job and feel so, you know, glad to be alive rather than all these terrible stories that I was reporting on. And it didn't hit me till about a year later. But the thing is, I didn't have to go and do those kind of stories day in, day in, no, day in and day out. What I think about you, Janine, and a lot of people that I know, when they're on that um, circuit of, I mean, really, when it comes down to it, call them a war reporter, they're in Rwanda one day, Chechnya the next, Bosnia the next, Iraq the next, Afghanistan the next. You know, I mean, soldiers have more rest and re relaxation than a war. Well, it's, it's really interesting you say that because one thing, I just had a conversation with Anthony Feinstein last week and he said to me, um, soldiers usually do two, maybe three tours of, of active duty, but the average time, and he's now interviewed, I think, 300 war reporters from around the world um, for his moral injury study. And he said that the, the average time is 15 years, and that's average. So many people, like, say, Jeremy Bowen, have been doing it 35, you know, John Swain must be up to 45 years. So um you know the yeah, sustained impact Cambodia and vietnam war and just yeah i'm doing it but or don mccullen um so i mean and and i think that the the actual the way that they chart the progression of it is by how many um you know years of sustained constant witnessing images of violence of of, of violence over and over and over again um, and 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 being helpless to prevent it or to protect people, um, and that is literally you know a kind of chipping away of the soul. And but what does is, it seem to make you um, a breed of cynics? I mean, maybe in the bar when you're you know knocking the back of an evening. But I mean, I'm always struck by the way that um, how compassionately people like John Swain could write having seen it all decade after decade. Yeah, I, well, I, I think it's- did you, ever, did, you, did you become cynical? No, you know, never. You, what, you know, your human rights work is leading you into some of the darkest places that man has been. And it, you don't despair, you, don't, you still feel hope? I, I do despair, absolutely. But I, I don't, um, I'm not cynical by nature. Um, I know when I first started working for the British press, um, it was interesting because it, it, all of my colleagues were much older than me and they were mostly men and they were extremely cynical. And um, there was a lot of bantering and a lot of dark jokes. And But um, I, I, I've never, I mean, I, I take what I do very, very seriously and I do see it as records of historical records. So I don't... Um, I've never, I've never really gotten um, jaded or, um, or I mean, I, I remember once being at a, it's a terrible story, but a mass grave with a colleague of mine who worked for the Daily Telegraph. And he looked at his watch and said, okay, maybe we can count the stiffs and make it back to Belgrade in time for lunch. And I mean, it was a joke. It was supposed to be a joke, but it was just so inappropriate and so wrong. And um, What's that, and what's often that I think well, that old book, that um, old I, book, has anyone here been raped speaks English as well? Or, <laughs> or, or scoop, or, or scoop. Um, so I, absolutely, and same thing. But, but um, no, going back to the moral injury, Sarah, what's really interesting too is that COVID, I think um, there, there will be a lot more cases of it after once we sort through what actually happened with COVID because for instance, healthcare workers that had to make enormous decisions about who gets a respirator and who doesn't, um, and had to make these massive um, kind of well, life life changing decisions will in some way be deeply affected by it. And and I also think, as a society in general, um, we've been we've been traumatized. Um, depending on where you were, I mean, I spent it in in France, and um, I spent the quarantine in France. It was very strict. Um, it was very rigid and people became very um, institutionalized, but also there was a huge amount of um, fear. And, and still, I just, I phoned one of my neighbors in New York and he was telling me now that our building is empty. 
you know, people are fleeing New York. Um, I keep, I'm getting letters from lots of friends who are saying, you know, we're leaving. There's no reason to stay in this city anymore. Um, so I think it's going to change remarkably the way the way that society is built and how we react to things and also how we react with each other. That's that's. Are you um, as a, people have used the language of war to describe what we're facing with COVID nineteen? Uh, it sounds like you kind of agree with that, that we're going to go through a sort of trauma of war. It's just one that an enemy you can't see, or am I exaggerating? Well, that, Emmanuel Macron called it a war. He said from his opening speech um, back in March, you know, we are at war. Um, I, I, animals? You know, I think that it certainly economically it's going to be, I think, I think, people are reacting to it in very different ways. So I think that um, we, we're going to have to respond in ways with resilience that we might not have known we had as, as societies together. Um, but I also think that a lot of, um, you know, each individual case, there's people who've been untouched by it, of course, who've been, you know, sheltering in, in places far away. And I have friends that have spent the whole time in Provence and, their children are barely aware that something's going on other than the fact that they're taking their classes on Zoom. But if you're stuck in an inner city and you have no money and you've lost your job or you're a waiter or a barista in Starbucks, um, it, your, your life is, is going to be horribly altered. Um, and <laughs> again, or if you've been sick, if you live in America and you've incurred massive medical bills. I mean, one of the most tragic things I heard was a nurse who was with a dying man. And the last thing he said was, who's going to pay for this? So I think we forget um, in the UK or in France that where we have socialized medicine that works, if you're in America and you can't pay, you, you can't afford private health insurance, you die. Um, and you know, even during COVID, people who didn't have insurance were racking up these massive bills. One of the uh, boys in my son's school he goes to, a, he's on a scholarship at a pr very exclusive private school in New York. Another boy who was on scholarship, his father died and the family couldn't afford to pay for the funeral. So, I mean, it's, oh, it, it's yeah, it's, it's, let, it's. Let me ask you, moving, you know, it's massive socioeconomic shift, I think. Yes, and not just socioeconomic shift, but also a shift in attitudes. We're seeing some of these lockdown protests or anti-lockdown protests in, mm -hmm. America and other places in the world. Uh, I mean, do you foresee the, a kind of this fueling a growth in nationalism? And I ask you because, you know, as I said before, you describe yourself as a multinational, a description I really like. I, my mother's mm -hmm. American. One of my grandmothers was French. I'm not as multinational as you, but I'm, I'm getting there. And uh, that's kind of how I see myself. And I, I've always been proud of that. And I'm sure you are too. But I feel there is a, a nationalism and a, not a very pretty kind of foot. And do you fear that leads to war and to man's inhumanity? What, what are your thoughts on that? I'm really concerned about America. I mean, for a time I was, I moved to America two years ago. Um, I, I, for a time I was very concerned about France and Germany and Scandinavia and the rise of, of populism in Europe. But America, um, especially post-Trump, is, is a terrifying place to be. Um, and it even, okay, if you take COVID, um, the, 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 those who deny it, um, I read a story of a friend whose, whose daughter went out with a mask and she was called a liberal, um, I don't wanna say, a liberal pussy basically for wearing a mask. So, I mean, um, I think yeah, I was pretty the, shocked when I saw those protesters with machine yeah. guns storming yeah, well, the legislature the, in Michigan. I mean, that's quite hardcore. It suddenly reminds you that the American Civil War was not that long ago. Well, the Second Amendment, um, I mean, America is protected, supposedly, by the tenets of democracy. So the rule of law, um, freedom of expression and human rights. But Trump has done an, an excellent job of eroding all of those things. He, um, he hates the press. Um, he hates um, the Washington Post, the New York Times. Um, he uses Fox News as his personal um, megaphone. 
Uh, he has no time at all for human rights. Rule of law doesn't exist with him, his family, and his cronies. So I'm basically, he's, he's managed to erode an entire, um, one of the most important parts of, of being an American, um, of democracy. So I don't know. I mean, I think it, I have, I do know people, academic friends of mine from Yale who do believe that we could, that civil war is something that isn't um, out of the question. And especially with, when you see the number of guns that people have bought in the past few months, um, how easy it is to buy guns, how accessible it is, the freedom in, in, in which people do this and how they react if that freedom could suddenly be taken away from them. I mean, this is my gun, I'm protecting my land. Um, yeah, and hopefully it's, it's not round the corner. It just was a sort of slightly unpleasant echo of, you know, of No, it is. Of and and I mean, divided. if you leave New York or Los Angeles, um, you know, there is Arkansas, there is Nebraska. There are places where, you know, red states, which are extremely conservative. Um, and these are places where Trump is still very popular. So I don't know what will happen with the election. Um, do you think he'll accept the result if he loses? No, I don't. Um, I think he might even postpone it. But I don't, I mean, I think he's done such a terrible job during COVID. And what's really amazing is that his supporters still stand by him. Um, so there is a whole, I mean, there's America and then there is America. As you know, you lived and you, you worked there for a long time. I love time. America, I should say. I, that's, I, that's why I'm going back. It's, it's a wonderful place. Well, it's a, it's a place where you can reinvent yourself and it's a place where you can, I mean, I love France and I love the life there, but there is something about America that you can, you can actually, you can work, you can, you can be successful, you can earn money. It's not a shameful thing. And in many ways, France still has this old, um, even though entrepreneurial spirit, entrepreneur came from uh, the French, it, it's, it's not a place where you could do that. So I think it's, I think what you said earlier, I think it is interesting if people can have a, um, a dimension of being multinational. I mean, it's, it's how I'm raising my son. And, um, and I think it's a huge advantage to, to have that. Now on that note, I'd love to throw questions open to the floor. So I'm gonna hand the mic back to Emily. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, our first Thank question, you. Dolly. Uh, Dolly, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, asking the question. Hi. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm walking along, so I'm, I'm going to stop and be less noisy. Um, but I just want to say an absolutely huge um, thank you. This has been so fascinating, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that has a massive intellectual crush on you. Uh, right now, um, I put in the chat box that uh, it sounds like your work is very much um, kind of ethnographic journalism in many ways. And I wondered um, what the most interesting differences in the reactions to your work in academia compared to your work in journalism and whether you would recommend for others to transcend those two worlds um, and, and whether that was a conscious decision that you made, you know, not just to be an academic or not just to be a journalist. Um, so yes, fascinating and thank you. Um, no, thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, so, I mean, I, in, in about 2014, right after the financial crash in 2008, I realized that newspapers were going through a major change and they weren't what, um, they weren't the same thing that Sarah and I grew up with. Um, the Sunday Times and the Times, which in those days had a lot of money and especially for foreign correspondents. Um, it was changing entirely. Um, digital publications and platforms were more popular. People didn't want to buy newspapers. And so what I what I did and what I do, which is long, fat, long format narrative nonfiction, um, was going out of style. And you could publish it in certain places like Granta or you could write books, but they weren't earning money. So I had a kind of um, um, a crisis and, and I realized that I had to go back and retrain somehow in order to earn a living because I'm the sole um, breadwinner in, in our family. I support my son entirely so I needed to earn a living um, and I went I got a scholarship to go back to a, a very prestigious American University Tufts University to, to study international law and I thought if I could use that with my field experience and um, the fact that I was a practitioner 
then I could, um, I could probably get a job at the UN or the World Bank or something like that. But what happened when I finished the degree, which was really, really tough to do because I was still working full time. I was the Middle East editor of Newsweek. I was raising a small boy um, and I was studying, um, which I hadn't done in you know many years. I finished it and I was recruited by um, the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a think tank in the US, which had been founded by Woodrow Wilson after um, World War I as a kind of de facto State Department. So I spent a year there and um, it, was, it was really interesting to be, you know, it was a big change from having been in journalism and wor working in newspapers and magazines. Um, and from there, I was recruited to Yale. So I was very lucky. It was, it, was a, it was a progression for me. But you asked the question of whether my work was much, was different. Um, the reactions to your work, just because um, there can be quite a lot of, um, I don't, I'm also in academia, and there can be quite a lot of poo-pooing of uh, journalism or being yeah, a you know, spokesperson. So I wondered what the main interesting differences were. Well, I'm, um, I'm at Yale's. Jackson Institute of Global Affairs, and the dean um, who runs it is Jim Levinson, is an economist, but he's an extraordinary man because what he wanted was practitioners. He wanted half academic tenure track, uh, old school academics, and half practitioners. So there's people there like um, uh, John Kerry, um, myself, um, lawyers who have worked on climate change, um, a lot of academics, a lot of political scientists, but but people also who've done field work for many, many years. So um, career ambassadors, diplomats. Um, and yes, I mean, there is, there is definitely a division between the practitioners and the pure academics, but I, I haven't, I mean, personally, I haven't noticed it at all. I mean, I find that they're um, very appreciative of our, of, for example, my field work, which a lot of times, as you know, academics don't, don't have the chance to do that. Um, so it, 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 it hasn't, I've been luckier, maybe I haven't noticed it. And that's a complete possibility that I just um, have been unaware of it. But thank you very much for your question. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dolly. I think we've got Gabriel next, who's uh, got a question about inspiring stories. Yes. Um, well, thank, thank you uh, for me as well. It's fascinating to listen to you. My story is, my question, sorry, is, you know, with all the horror you've witnessed and vulnerable and victimized people and communities you've interacted with, I'm curious about what you'd say is the most inspiring story that you've reported on or something that you carry with you. Because I'm sure you've also seen a lot of people, uh, you know, persevere through those experiences or sort of done almost subhuman efforts in the face of them. So I was interested in hearing some of those um, more positive things that come out of it and how you deal with that. You, you say you're not cynical and try to be positive. So I'm sure there's a lot of fascinating stories there that you've reported on. Well, I, um, I worked briefly for the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. And one of the things that we were constantly told to look for was stories of resilience. Um, and this one specific job I had was to work in several refugee camps in Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, and um, Egypt and to try to find uh, women, again, Sarah, you mentioned earlier, women's stories, but this was a, a specific report about Syrian women who were alone because their husbands were either fighting back in Syria or were killed. So how they were coping. Um, and one thing that I remember, which it's, it's a small thing, but it was really incredible, was how they, um, would find each other, like the, the women from certain villages when they would flee and they would cross the borders and they would get to, let's say, Jordan, to Zatari camp. Um, and then how they would immediately set themselves up into um, not new lives, because none of them wanted to be there and all of them wanted to go home, but how they would try to organize for instance, getting their kids educated, so setting up little schools, or how they would how they would try to. I'm thinking of there was this one kind of um, impromptu. It wasn't a psychiatric clinic, but what it was was a group of women who got together and had a sewing circle. And it sounds so banal, but it was amazing because what they did is they would sit and they would speak for hours about 
how sad they were or people they had lost and they would cry and they would comfort each other. And it was this almost like a group therapy session. Um, so, I mean, in any kind of um, war, even COVID now, you know, we've all seen these amazing stories of the healthcare workers, you know, and how lauded they've been um, for their for their courage and their resilience. You you always find people who are extraordinary, who just have managed to somehow um, take from from terrible situations the very best. And and it, it does go back to this incredible um, resilience that that I do believe human beings have. Um, and when it comes down to it and you need to exercise that, you do have it. Thanks, Gabriel. I, yeah. I hope that answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to add anything from your perspective on that as well, or? Well, I think um, the way, when I've always found it really inspiring to talk to people who have um, overcome terrible difficulties. I mean, I went to um, Lesbos uh, last year and uh, the situation there was pretty terrible. There are about 5,000 refugees in the formal camp of Mariah and on the island, but thousands more overspilling. And frankly, I think their numbers have doubled, at least doubled in the past year. So the crisis is only getting worse. And it does Amid all the horror and the need to really alert people to what's going on in these places, uh, does come a certain confidence as well in the human spirit because people are so brave and so determined and they've come such a long way to even make it to this tiny island in the middle of the Aegean Sea. And they're determined to go on and they're just trying to do their best for themselves and their families. and. So even among the heartbreak and the anger over how people are treated, um, there is something about that human resilience that, that, that means a lot. And it, it is important to tell those stories as well. You know, during the, um, during the siege of Sarajevo, which was a terrible medieval siege, and there was no electricity and no water, and no heat, and people really, really suffered. They were so determined not to be broken as as Sarajevans, as a city, as a country. And what they used, and it's really interesting in the aftermath to go back and to talk to people about it, was humor. Um, and they were really famous for, for this Bosnian dark humor. And they had all these jokes about the siege and they had, um, you know, just ways that they refused, absolutely refused to be broken. And, you know, there's other things too, sport, for instance, um, in Africa and Sierra Leone, um, in terms of post-conflict, sport has been used, music has been used. Um, there's, there's all kinds of ways that people can heal through, um, That's right. you know, in rising life, above. The families were gathering around the braziers at night, singing songs, the kids would be kicking a football around. I mean, people were still creating family life in the most desperate circumstances and, and really you've got to be proud of people's spirit in that context. Or even um, I was in part of the book I'm writing now is set in Gaza and Gaza has got to be one of the most miserable places on earth. Um, the UN said in 2020 it would be unlivable and it's 2020 and that was before COVID. Um, which remarkably they haven't had that many cases but the the fact that there's no clean water the constant um, oppression from Israel and, and from Egypt and, and Hamas. Um, but one thing that I'm, I'm almost envious of is the family life there. Um, the way that people are so closely bonded together, the families, the clans, um, and, and in, in a way it's their, it's their armor against an incredibly oppressive and, and difficult life. Gosh. Amazing. We, we've got a, a question about your upcoming book, Janine. Uh, Janine. But before that, um, I think haley has got a question. It might be directed first at Sarah. Uh, Haley Davidson. Thank you. Um, thanks for a fascinating discussion. And I, I especially loved that last question because I think right now um, 
as ever, but more than ever, the, these stories of hope are are just so, so important to all of us. Um, and I love both of your answers. Um, my question, um, as, as someone who's worked in the media for a really long time, do you feel that the media is increasingly both polarised and polarising? Um, and do you think there's a, there's a need to kind of fight back against that trend? And how do we do that? Um, I think there are aspects of the media that are getting more polarized, but actually it's really the social media that is extremely polarized. And that's what, um, there's something about the sort of system of sort of likes and shares, etc. that seems to rapidly drive one down a route to more and more extremist views. The more, the harsher your views, the more widely, and I say this from the left or the right, the more widely things are shared because they generate outrage as well as praise and support and therefore they sort of grow exponentially. I feel a bit, I mean, Janine was right earlier. She reminded me, I felt a little chastened when she reminded me that war was always dangerous for correspondence and that, you know, it hadn't changed that much. I'd say what is now called the sort of, you know, the, I mean, the media in terms of the newspapers, they were always polarized. We can think back to uh, the 1980s and all that sort of stick it up your junta era of the sun. And uh, I, you know, actually all that that means is that the media widely reflects in its different ways, the, the actual feelings of people out there. You know, the, the media is not there to sort of preach one set of virtues. It's there to serve its readers with what its readers are interested in. And people are polarized and people have different views. And I think I, I'm an absolute supporter of media pluralism in the sense that, you know, it's very important you have the mirror and the sun, that you have the guardian and the telegraph. Um, but I do worry about that, um, multi the force multiplier that social media is in terms of really driving more and more extremist content. And I know that the social media Aaron's themselves are concerned about that, although they never seem to do anything about it, of course. Apart from Twitter today with its, you know, yesterday with its verification and fact checking of Trump's tweets. Got it. And um, I'm going to combine two questions that have been sent to me uh, privately. One is asking Jean about uh, picking up on what you said about the book about vanishing Christian cultures in the Middle East. And then the other one to both of you, which is asked on the book theme if you had. Um, one recommendation to give to young women who are thinking about careers both in kind of foreign and war reporting and maybe domestic journalism, what would you suggest that they go and read? Um, so the first question about my next book, uh, it's yeah. called The, the Vanishing. Uh, I hope to finish it in the next few months. I mean, um, the lockdown has been a very useful time for work for me. Um, and it's basically set in several communities in the Middle East, Northern Iraq, Egypt, Gaza, and Syria um, about the eradication of these communities, um, partially because of uh, radical radicalism. For instance, ISIS going through these Christian villages in northern Iraq and, and, um, and displacing people. But the other part of it is economics. So um, Christians no longer having a role or um, livelihood in these places, let's say Gaza, where they're at the four, before the fourth century, Gaza was entirely Christian. There's 800 Christians left there now, um, who many of them just can't earn a living um, because of the, the, the permanent lockdown in Gaza. Um, so it's about that. It's about their faith and how they have, despite um, centuries of discrimination and persecution, remained uh, Christians and have held on to their culture and their tradition. Um, and it comes out in the UK. It will be published by Bloomsbury, hopefully next spring. Um, the second part of your question, what should young women who want to be foreign correspondents read? Um, well, I think, I mean, I studied comparative literature. So, I mean, I, I always think it's the best thing to read are the classic Dostoevsky and Chekhov and um, and Faulkner, I was talking to a friend about William Faulkner, Faulkner last night. And I, you know, I teach at Yale, one of the courses I teach is about um, reporting war. Although it's not a journalism class, it's more for lawyers or those who will go on to work in the field and need to write reports about um, atrocities. So, you know, I think it's what you should read or books that resonate with you, um, the voice 
that that is the voice that you want to the way you want to write um, so it, it could it could change i don't i don't think necessarily you should read i mean i'd love you to read my books but um you don't have to read other journalist memoirs um i think uh you know you classic read as much as you can in terms of literature and, and get a good sense of rhythm and style and voice and also how narrative nonfiction works, um, putting together a story, you know, a beginning, a middle and end, making good dialogue. Um, dialogue is very difficult to do. Um, so, you know, kind of reading the masters of that. I just, I've just read um, an amazing novel, which won um, the American Academy of Arts and Letters prize for fiction called The Overstory by Richard Powers. And he's a novelist I had never heard of before. Um, and it's a book about trees. Now, I never would have read a book about trees, but the skillful narrative, the way this fiction, but it's it still, it inspired me to be a better writer. So I think you find whatever it is, a novel, um, a columnist, um, it might be an essayist, it might be someone who was writing about Paris in the 1920s. I'm reading a book now by Mavis Gallant, who is a Canadian um, Canadian journalist based in Paris during the war. Um, so, you know, you really find something that resonates with your own writing voice and you use that. Well, I think uh, everything that Janine said really struck true. I mean, you should just read as widely and um, as possible really, but there, um, there are some great books by women correspondents. Um, Janine obviously has written a number of them and, and they, I can't recommend them highly enough. I think um, I can mention a couple of other really good ones um, if you want to be inspired by other war correspondents, female ones. And I should say incidentally that a friend of, when a, a friend of mine, when she heard I was giving this talk tonight um, with Janine said, Janine was incredibly helpful to her when she was setting up as a young foreign correspondent. And uh, th there was such a supportive female network. And that's really inspiring in its own, it, itself because I know how competitive the media is. And I do know that all these great women war correspondents, and there are several, are fiercely competitive. But they are supportive as well, and they're very... Um, encouraging to young women who want to break into the field and will give you their advice very freely, just as Janine has just now. I'll mention a few things. I mean, I don't know of a war reporter, female one, who hasn't been influenced by Martha Gellhorn in some way or other, as the Bonds and Origo of um, war reporters. Um, uh, there's a terrific um, book by Lindsay Hilsom, who is the reporter for Channel 4 News um, about Marie Colvin, the life of Marie Colvin, called In Extremis. And I note that title because I was, um, I know that Janine once described the life of a war reporter as a life in extremis. So that's obviously, you know, a, a phrase that resonates. And it is very um, interesting to read Marie's life story because it also gives insight into some of the difficulties as well as some of the great achievements of being a war reporter. Um, Christina Lamb at the Sunday Times just brought out an extraordinary book called Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, all about what happens to women in war. And, um, and finally, I just want to give a shout out to a young reporter at the Sunday Times called Louise Callahan. I mentioned her before, lockdown in Sweden. Um, she just volunteered to go to Turkey as a freelance journalist uh, on a small contract, got herself out there, she's still in her 20s, you know, just made herself, she was there for the Turkish coup, a bit of luck has to do with it, but you know, she was right there on the scene, she, but she ran with that story, she really made her own luck as far as making her name as a correspondent is concerned. Then she started to move out into the you know, Syrian border because she went into Mosul with the American troops. And she's now published a book called Father of Lions about um, an extraordinary zookeeper in Mosul throughout the um, recent conflict there. And I, I think there are so many inspiring women like Louise, like Janine, like Christina. In fact, actually I say so many, there aren't that many. But the ones that are there are amazing. And you'll find that it's their own guts, determination, 
you know, Janine already talked about the sort of chance story that led her on this extraordinary career that she's had, that set her on her path. And it's a, if you have that sort of eye for a story that you just really want to follow, you can make things happen in the most astonishing way. And I, I don't know a woman reporter who hasn't sort of started out almost by chance along this route, but has shown such guts and determination along the way. Amazing. Well, that's, that's, that's quite some list, quite some recommendation. I hope everyone was taking that down. Um, I know that uh, Janine, with her busy schedule, has got to go soon. Um, so if I may, uh, I know there have been some other questions. I'm, I'm sorry if we can't get to all of them, but uh, I'm going to kind of ask you for both uh, uh, your kind of last thoughts. And uh, two people have mentioned this in questions that have come, which is if there's one story that you have reported on or known about that has been underappreciated and people need to know about, what is it? Uh, Janine, sorry, you're, you've just, you're just muted. There we go. Perfect. Better? Thanks. Okay. Yes, great, thanks. I, I think Africa is wildly unreported. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, if you ask me what was the most important story I've ever reported, it, it would be Bosnia, which I think colored my entire life, my entire career, which I still think about every day. Um, it's coming up to the anniversary of Srebrenica. Um, 8,000 men, Muslim men and boys were killed. And it still, still has a huge impact on everything I do. But I, during the 90s, um, working in Africa, I was aware of how little reporting there was and how it was shunted to the back pages. And it still is. And um, even, you know, looking at stories that are so important now um, on transitional justice in places like South Sudan or um, Kenya, it, it, it's just, it's not, we, we, we often go places, um, editors will send reporters to Afghanistan or to Pakistan or to Iraq, and they'll, they'll you know, be there for a, a scoop or um, a big event, and then they leave. And it's really important, I think, that there are people on the ground, which is important why we should train local reporters. And I'm on the board of something called the Institute of War and Peace Reporting, and what we do is we train people in Iraq, in Syria, in Jordan, um, all around the world to report on their own countries and to report in conflict. Um, another, another conflict that is really ignored is Yemen. Um, even during COVID, you know, the bombing has continued in Yemen, a terrible situation. Very, very, very little coming out of that. Um, Libya, not a lot coming out there. There's, um, it, it's interesting how sometimes newspapers will make decisions and they will focus on it and then they'll stop. Um, and unless you are, you know, you decide to, you want to make Libya your story. And there are several reporters that do that. Um, you've really got to seek it out. Um, I hope that answered it in a very kind of winding way. It definitely did. Sarah, very briefly, have you got one? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll answer it from the sort of point of view of a, a, an editor, because actually the really shocking thing and surprising thing, if, you're, if you don't actually work in newspapers or, or uh, television or wherever, is that how many stories do go unreported simply because people aren't there. Um, we only have limited resources. And say the BBC or ITV or CNN, they decide to send a camera crew, the whole team. That's a very expensive business. And they only send to certain places and then everybody sends to the same place. And, you know, the dread word in newspaper journalism is the forgotten war because they're usually forgotten because nobody's there. And then because nobody's there, nobody actually cares about it. I mean, I went flew to South Africa and I had to, it was a very cheap flight. So I stopped off in the Congo. And um, at Brazzaville, or somewhere. And I think that's, anyway, I could see that planes were flying and some strafing was going on. And I was assured, no, no, it's always like that. And I never even heard of that there was any low level or intense conflict going on there. So there's so many forgotten wars that the media can't cover. And I'm going to end with a plea to your audience that they may or may not want to hear, which is, journalism costs money and foreign reporters are among the most expensive in the business not because they're extravagant, but because they have to get places, they have to stay places, they have to hire local people on the ground to help them, translators, the rest of it. It's very expensive. And if people don't pay for news, they will die. They are very vulnerable. And the reason why we don't have the money 
at the Sunday Times for pay for everything in the way that we did when Janine started there is because people don't seem to think they need to pay for news anymore. They can just get it for free. But that comes with a price and foreign news is paying the price. Gosh, well, very inspiring note to end on. I cannot thank uh, Jean and Sarah enough for this um, chat. Just a reminder that if you'd like to listen to the session again, if you're not a friend already, please join. Uh, spread the word. There are more big tent events coming up, but really a huge round of applause to, to Sarah and Janine. Um, thank you very, very, very much. Really, really no, inspiring thank you. stuff. It was, and, it was a lot um, of fun. Thank you. Brilliant. And I know both of you guys have got to go. The room will be open informally. The speakers will, the speakers will go if anyone wants to chat amongst themselves. But thank you so much. See you at another event soon. Thank you. And Bye. have fun. Thank you so much. Bye both. <laughs>